business is a debate on motion 8766 in the name of Rachel Hamilton on reconsidering highly protected marine areas. I'd be grateful if members who wish to speak were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Rachel Hamilton to speak to and move the motion. Can I have Ms Hamilton's Thank microphone? you, Presiding Officer, and I move the motion in my name. Today's debate on highly protected marine areas is a rare opportunity for the Parliament to agree on something. We should all agree on standing up for coastal and fishing communities. Last month, the First Minister outlined his priorities for Scotland. He spoke for almost half an hour. He failed to mention fishing or farming once. However, it is never too late to start listening, admit your mistakes and go back to the drawing board. In opening this debate, I appeal directly to SNP MSPs representing coastal communities and to other colleagues who want to see Scottish fishing thrive in the future. Anyone who rigidly follows the party line when they know the damage that these plans could do will owe an explanation to their constituents, Scotland's fishing industry and coastal and rural communities. This is not about siding with me and my colleagues on these benches. It's about siding with the Scottish fishing industry. We should be proud of this industry, which contributes over half a billion pounds worth to our economy each year. On top of the challenges that they are already facing with spatial squeeze, they are contending with a fishing ban that threatens to destroy their livelihoods for good. It is clear to them, as it is to us, the proposed fishing ban goes too far with too little evidence. And we know how this came about on a dark day in a dishonourable agreement signed in August 2021. Mary McCallan's amendment today shows that this government is not only failing to listen to the concerns of our fishermen and coastal communities, but they've turned their back on science and certainty. It makes a mockery of the consultation process by taking for granted the fact that HPMAs will be designated. Popeye Ewing must have fishermen's forearms to have ripped this document apart last night. Believe me, I've tried. The SNP motion potentially misleads the Parliament in suggesting the plans are in line with the EU, when in fact Scotland's already gone over and above their own MPA targets. They cite evidence from one area and entirely ignore contradictory evidence from another. The Butte House Agreement has much to answer for. It rides roughshod over the livelihoods of hard-working fishermen with a blatant disregard for the communities that they support and the science around the matter that we are discussing today. The arbitrary figure of 10% of Scottish waters for highly protected marine area designation has been plucked from the sky with no scientific backing or ecological justification to underpin it. The First Minister insisted that the government would not impose these policies on communities that don't want them. Now that line has changed to vehement opposition. Even if that could be defined or measured, it is evident that the government is moving the goalposts. There is no explanation of the problem that this, these proposals are trying to address or the goal it is trying to achieve. We don't even know how effective the existing MPA network is in supporting and maintaining biodiversity in our waters. There's been no impact assessment on how these plans would affect our coastal communities. There's been no feasibility study into how these areas could be implemented and enforced. Presiding officer, my colleague Murdo Fraser has just discussed a recent inquiry we learned that former ministers, senior civil servants and special advisers believe Scottish Government decision-making is rushed, unclear and unstructured, as we saw with the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. Presiding officer, we are here again. To describe this policy as rushed, unclear and unstructured would be far too generous. But on the other side of this conversation, the fishing sector have taken their time to construct clear, coherent arguments against these proposals. Nonetheless, I think it is important to say that I absolutely understand the need to protect our marine environment. I'm certain that this is another point on which we can all agree. 
Yes. Cabinet Secretary. I am grateful to Rachel Hamilton for taking the intervention. Uh, in March, her colleague Therese Coffey, the Conservative Secretary of State for the Environment, called HPMAs a vital way forward. She subsequently introduced them in England. How does she reconcile that with her remarks? Rachel Hamilton. The difference between the way that, that your government are approaching it, Cabinet Secretary, is that you are not bringing on the coastal communities with you. This document is a paper exercise that is an online process that has had no consultation with any coastal communities at all. The difference between the UK government approach is that DEFRA consulted with coastal communities and, and the fishermen even agreed on the sites that were proposed. No one gets this more than fishermen, presiding officer, because without good fish stocks, their businesses would struggle. As the former finance secretary said, sever the lifeline of fishing and you undermine the wider econ economy of coastal communities. She is right. And this is a clear sign of the need to work with fishermen on these issues, instead of imposing arbitrary, unevidenced restrictions on their activities. With sustainable fishing practices, our fleet has seen fish stocks rebound over the last 20 years. Place, Hake, Haddock have all seen their populations grow considerably in this time because of their own sustainable practices. And that is down to the hard work of those fishermen who know our seas best, not the result of top-down desktop policies as we heard last night in Beatrice Wishart's debate. Our coastal communities have asked for the Scottish Government to reconsider these plans. The fishermen in these vulnerable, rural, fragile coastal communities need to be heard. Today, with this motion, the Scottish Parliament is presented with a clear choice. We can stand behind these communities, go back to the drawing board and work with them, rather than against them to protect our seas. Or we can press ahead with these unevidenced, unwanted and hugely damaging plans. We should be under no illusions. These communities are clear that a fishing ban is an existential threat, not just to their jobs, but to their way of life. And we have an opportunity today to send them a message that we have listened and we will support them. And we have a plan to do that. And we want to work with this government and all parties to make sure we can protect them and our oceans. And I believe our amendments reflect this. I believe that the amendments to the motion from Labour and to the Liberal Democrats show their willingness to do this. And I absolutely welcome their support to standing up for fishermen. And I'm sure there will be others on the back benches who will also stand up for their constituents too. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Mary McAllen to speak to and move Amendment 8766.3 up to five minutes, Cabinet Thank Secretary. you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Um, not having a great deal of time today, I'm going to restrict my opening remarks on behalf of the government to what I think are the key issues in hand here. Firstly, that it's an unavoidable truth that we are in the midst of a climate and nature emergency. This Parliament recognised that when every party proceeded to pass some of the world's most ambitious climate targets into law. Now, our oceans are a vital part of the emergency response that are needed. Scotland's marine environment stores at least 5.6 billion tonnes of CO2. But recent research is showing that the oceans are reaching their capacity to help us. That's because of a, a number of issues, including human impacts upon them. If we don't protect our seas, they will not be able to protect us for much longer. Uh, and despite the, the considerable progress that has been made to improve the state of our oceans, the Scottish Marine Assessment of 2020 shows that a number of species are in decline. Uh, the most recent assessment under the I will do in a sec. Uh, the most recent assessment under the UK Marine Strategy showed that across the UK, 11 out of 15 indicators of good environmental status are being missed. And I'll take an intervention from Finlay Carson. Yeah, I appreciate Carson. the Cabinet Secretary taking the intervention. Could you set out exactly how banning fishing will reduce greenhouse gases? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Finlay Carson may wish to use language such as banning fishing. The point is that we are in a consultation. We're in the midst of a consultation which asks exactly about the principles of HPMAs, including how they are constituted and what features we may wish to uh, we may wish to protect, including blue carbon, which would directly respond to your point. But it's not just about carbon, it's about uh, ecosystems, it's about species abundance, 
all of which are absolutely critical to equilibrium of our natural world, all of which is connected to the climate emergency. So I would expect Finlay Carson to understand that. Um, and that, that matters to me, presiding officer, and that matters most of all to the people who are economically, socially and culturally co connected with our seas. And of course, that brings me to my second point, that it's an unavoidable truth that as we take the action that we have to take to respond to the climate emergency, we have to do it in a way that's fair, that's just, that leaves no one and no community behind. And that's a task that I'm committed to. It's a task that this government is committed to, and it's one that we take very seriously indeed. And that is why we have approached this really complex and uh, emotive topic with as much democracy as we possibly can. It's why being so early in the process, the Scottish Government has held no less than 40 stakeholder meetings, both in the development of the consultation and since then to assist uh, stakeholders in completing the same. I'm sorry, I don't have any more time to take interventions from the Conservatives. Um, the meetings that we held included regional inshore fisheries groups, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, uh, the Communities Inshore Fisheries Alliance, the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation. It's why we met yesterday with MSPs. It's why I've committed to meet with communities across the summer. And it's why I reiterate my commitment to look very closely at the thousands of consultation responses that we have received. And I commit myself to that without politicking without positioning, which, with regret, I'm afraid some Members. are very much engaging with. Let's be clear, every party in this parliament was elected on a manifesto commitment to marine protection. The Conservatives stood on a manifesto... No, I don't have time, I'm afraid. Uh, the Conservatives stood on a manifesto commitment to HPMA pilots. The Labour Party stood on a manifesto to include 20% of Scotland's waters in highly protected marine areas, double what this Scottish Government consultation uh, proposed. So I assume, um, presiding officer, that we can agree that action is needed. But I want to uh, address, in the time I have left, I realise I'm very I'm, short I'm of afraid, time. I'm um, afraid, Cabinet Secretary, that you are over time and I will I have am, to ask I you am to short of time. conclude so let at me this just, point. Let me just... um, I, I cannot, regrettably, as shame, we are very officer. tight for time this afternoon. Um, I now call on Rhoda Grant to speak to and move Amendment 8766.1. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by expressing our disappointment at the Scottish Government's amendment. The tone and the content don't demonstrate any understanding of the consternation felt by our coastal communities. Let me be clear, we are all concerned about our marine environment and protecting it, none more so than those whose parents fished the seas, who themselves continue to fish and who wish to make sure that their children will be able to fish in the future as well. In support of the government's proposals, we all often have quoted the example of Lamlash Bay, but that example makes my point. Lamlash Bay was not imposed on the community by the government. It was fought for by the community, by local people who know their seas, who fought hard for the powers, the powers for which the Scottish government now seek to take credit. It took them 13 long years to fight a system and get that protection. It's also noticeable that Broad Bay is not so often quoted as an example. Presiding officer, these MP, HPMA proposals seek to ban the most sustainable form of fishery that we have, and that's static gear boats. They're small boats that fish in local waters. They can't move to other fishing grounds. A very short... Rachel Hamilton. At Broad Bay, the only species that's really left, I believe, is starfish. That is correct. And it, it, it has caused untold damage to the fishery there. I think the other thing that can't help but leave us gasping at this proposal is that paddle boats and swimming can also be banned under these proposals. It makes no sense at all. We're also concerned that more and more fisheries will be funneled into smaller areas that will end up overfished. And it's really concerning that these proposals have been top down. The First Minister gave the commitment that they wouldn't be imposed on coastal communities. The Scottish Government motion now says they will not be on, imposed on communities that are vehemently opposed to them. 
Do they really want to see those communities demonstrate vehement opposition? What would that look like? This is not a just transition. I already am hearing about boats going on sale and families preparing to move away as a direct result of this policy. It's deeply damaging and given that these areas concerned are also subject to depopulation right now. The uncertainty surrounding this is damaging local economies. People can't invest, banks won't support them, and their businesses may not have any future. It's not just fisheries that are involved, it's fish farming, seaweed cultivation and harming, harvesting. The list is long and many as well as including many businesses that depend on marine tourism. Yet Scotland areas are exempt. The waters that were sold on the cheap with no community benefit will be exempt in order, in order to protect foreign investors. Exempting them and their profits just shows the priorities of this government. They don't care about small business. One or two people businesses that are being put out of work, work and forced to leave. These small businesses are not being given any exclusions. Presiding officer, I've never seen such a backlash. Everyone I've spoken to in coastal communities are furious. It takes a lot to drive people to write songs. It takes even more to make Donald Francis sing them. Do not underestimate the vehement opposition to this. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move Amendment 8766.2. Thank you. Um, so it appears that you wait ages for a debate on HPMAs and then two come along in very quick succession. Can I start by again thanking those who took part in last night's uh, debate, led by my colleague uh, Beatrice Wishart. I, I think it sent the most unambiguous message about the strength of cross-party opposition to the government's proposed approach on HPMAs. This is merely a reflection, of course, of the anger and, in some cases, fury felt in island and coastal communities the length and breadth of Scotland. So it's right we return to this subject again today, and I thank Rachel uh, Hamilton for allowing us to do so. The government's amendment, sadly, is a rather predictable and vintage example of what about it. I mean, Brexit continues to cause great damage. UK Tory government policies on skilled worker visas are indefensible. But as Elspeth MacDonald of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation has made clear, whatever issues the industry has with Brexit and labour rules, these pale into insignificance if fishermen are banned from fishing. The topic of the debate um, today is the same as last night, but the cast list looks a little different. Much like the HPMA designation, those operating arguments uh, felt to be damaging or potentially damaging to the Butte House Agreement are to be arbitrarily excluded. So it is that Fergus Ewing and Kate Forbes find themselves confined to port by the SNP Whips Office. Yet, appropriately, there's no evidence this forced tie-up regime will provide any sort of protection for the SNP Green Government's policy on HPMAs, particularly when assurances that were previously offered up by the First Minister and Cabinet Secretary are already being redefined and diluted. Hamza Youssef could not have been clear in stating he would not impose these policies on communities that don't want them, a promise echoed by the Cabinet Secretary. Now we are told there needs to be, quote, vehement opposition, whatever that means. Presiding officer, the lack of any prior discussion or consultation with stakeholders in the fishing, aquaculture and other key sectors most directly affected is inexcusable. It has seen government policy developed, I don't have time, I'm afraid, Mr Whittle, developed and consulted on over years, upended and replaced by closed-door negotiations in Butte House between the SNP and Greens. That's not evidence-based policy-making. It's not ministers being inclusive or accessible. And it makes a mockery of any commitment this government professes to genuine island-proofing, a point made in my amendment, which I move. And damage is already being done, as Rhoda Grant said, through heightened uncertainty and a collapse in confidence. Reaching agreement on measures that might actually help protect our marine environment have been made more difficult to achieve. And the government's handbrake turn undermines those in the fishing sector already leading efforts to manage, protect and enhance stocks and biodiversity. In my own Orkney con uh, constituencies, fishers recognise their sector relies on healthy ecosystems and environment. They've been working in partnership with academics, environmental groups on a range of projects. 
tagging brown crab, trialling technology in creels to measure environmental variables such as salinity, temperature, light and current, using cameras to understand interactions of creels with the seabed, recording sightings of cetaceans and seabirds, carrying out a carbon audit of Orkney's fleet, precisely what we would want to see in the interests of our fishing sector, the marine environment and our island and coastal communities. But, President Officer, let me finish with the words of Hannah Fennell of Orkney Fisheries Association, who told me earlier this week, and I quote, HPMAs undermine the concept of environmental stewardship. Instead of punishing those who live near and work in the marine environment, the government should be empowering communities and fishers. The knowledge fishers hold should be seen as an asset and part of the solution to the twin climate crises. I could not agree more. Thank you. Thank you. We move to open debate speeches and I call on Edward Mountain to be followed by Karen Adam. Thank you, officer. And uh, I'd just like to say at the outset, I was taken by the call that I was on yesterday afternoon with many of the MSPs where we were asked for our opinions on HPMAs. A bit late. Not sure that it had actually followed the advice that had been given. And it was disturbing, and it must have been disturbing to the Minister that she heard from nearly all of the MSPs that the level of responses and the pure venom in some of those responses had not been experienced by parliamentarians before. Now, Presiding Officer, you will know, as, as I do, that uh, many uh, songs and folk songs that you hear are written either about heroes or villains. Now, in this case, we've had a folk song written, The Clearances Again, and it's not about heroes. It's about villains, and that's the way the islanders view it. Now, looking at the Highland and Islands MSPs, I don't think there's any doubt that we, on this side uh, of the chamber, understand it. And I know Labour understand it. And I know the Liberal Democrats get it. I'm pretty sure the Greens don't get it. And I'm pretty sure that some of the MSPs on the SNP benches get it. We listened to Fergus Ewing last night, and I'll come back to that. He gets it. And I think Kate Forbes gets it. But what's clear is the other two Highlands and Islands MSPs, Mary Todd and Emma Roddick, don't get it. In fact, I don't even see them in the chamber today. Perhaps because that's because they have taken the government shilling so they don't have to respond or take part in this debate. But they will pay for it at the next election. Of that, there is no doubt. Presiding officer. Yes, I would take an intervention. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, uh, for Edward Mountain, for taking the intervention. He'll know of the united opposition by the whole of Scotland's seafood sector to HPMAs. Does he agree with me that these proposals are not only about the survival of fishing and aquaculture, but also the very communities that rely on them? Edward Mountain. Absolutely they are, and I'd like to thank, at this stage, Beatrice Wiscott for enabling the debate last night. It was really interesting. Because one thing that we must understand, and I'm going to come on to it, is the importance of those people who are employed in the local economy and live in the local economy not to have their livelihoods destroyed. Now, presiding officer, there's no doubt if you start a hare running, it's difficult to stop it. And that's exactly what this government has done with HPMAs. They have no clear idea how they're going to achieve their aims, but they have a clear idea that they've got to get on with it because the Greens are telling them to do it. They've got no clear idea how they're going to save the jobs of the fishermen. But the Greens don't care about that because, to them, those jobs are collateral damage. And they are going to push on with a policy that, to me, is not based on the knowledge of those people who live and work in the environment, who have protected that environment, who cherish that environment and have no wish to destroy it because it forms part of their livelihood. Yes, I will take an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. Full uh, to Edward Mountain for taking an intervention. I just wondered if he would accept, because I agree with him about the importance of the communities, and right from the beginning I've been clear that this would have been uh, developed hand in hand with them. By a broad and deep consultation right at the beginning of this process, how else does he think I could have more meaningfully engaged those communities who I have been so clear I care deeply about? 
Edward Moncton. Uh, presiding officer, I don't know if I'll get my time back from that, but no, that's not what the community see. The community see a centralised government pushing down from on top <laughs> without listening to a word that they're saying. And all I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, if you're in doubt about that, take your time, come up to my office, have a look at some of the emails that I've got. I'm very happy to share them with you. Now, presiding officer, I know by taking interventions that I've actually ended my... Oh, I'll have to end my speech early. S sorry, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Karen Adam to be followed by Katie Clark. Thank you, presiding officer. And I want to firstly start by saying that I have had sincere and deep ponderings over this debate today and in fact over the last few weeks and I have had cause to really take time to reflect. Now my concerns around HPMAs and the impact they will have on fishers and coastal communities across Scotland are well known to the Scottish Government. First and foremost however I hope they are known to the fishers across my constituency because representing coastal communities of Bampshire and Bucking Coast is a great honour and one I do not take lightly. And it is for this reason, President Officer, that I wish at the outset to make this promise to them. I promise I will never support a policy that would be to the detriment of the lives and livelihoods of the coastal communities across Scotland. I was elected to be a strong voice for our coastal communities and a steward and an advocate of not just the people, but also the land and the sea. And I will be just that. Our rural communities have been through a great deal over the last few years. And as a member of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, I've listened to some devastating testimonies about the impact of Brexit on our farmers and fishers. The loss of EU funding as a result of the reckless Tory Brexit is just one example of the significant damage imposed on our rural economies. We place so much responsibility for delivering net zero on our rural industries and we must remember that our farmers and fishers are also responsible for our food security. Yes, I will. Will I get the time back? I appreciate the member taking the intervention, but on Brexit, would the member not agree with me, it's not Brexit that's hell-bent on banning fishing in a vast swath overseas, it's the Greens and the SNP that want to do that. No, I, I disagree with the member's take on that, and I will come to that later on my next speech, but this, the whole rhetoric around ban on fishing, I'll come to this uh, politics, which is seem to be driven by popularity, and that's not helpful to this debate, and it's not constructive. We do place a lot of burden and responsibility, and they are responsible for our food security. So if we place ever greater burdens on them, we must ensure that we also provide the relative financial, human and, yes, legislative support. Fishers have lost trust in politicians to deliver for them. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. And this is the sorry result of being used as a political football for so long and having their priorities consistently politicised. Now that brings me to the motion before us in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Are we really supposed to believe, after everything the Tories have done over the last few years, to bring our rural industries to the brink and our economy to the knees, that they are trustworthy custodians of our farms, fisheries or natural environment? Need I say more than Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, Brexit? And despite Tory indignation, in March it was announced that HPMAs will be introduced south of the border by the Tory UK government. The hypocrisy is astonishing. Yesterday, Rachel Hamilton said that she would... She is obviously opposed to HPMAs. Well, why does she stand on a Tory manifesto commitment in 2021 to implement pilot schemes of them. To the fishers listening at home, be aware of this. The Cabinet Secretary will be reassured that I do not intend to tear up any motion in a fit of theatrics today, although my colleague Rachel Hamilton uh, did state that she'd like to see that. The Scottish Parliament is not a place for amateur dramatics. It's a place where we debate, discuss as reasonable representatives the genuine needs of our constituents and of our country. You must I want conclude, to thank Ms. Adam. the Cabinet Secretary for the constructive discussions. Thank you, Ms Adam. You must conclude at that point. I call Katie Clark to be followed by Jamie Halker-Johnson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And there's already been mention this afternoon of the Lamb Lash No Take Zone. And having represented Arran, it is clear that strong marine protection can have support and buy in from local communities. The Community of Arran Seabed Trust Coast was founded in 1995 and led successful community campaigns to establish Scotland's first no take zone. The Scottish Government has much to learn from the approach of coast and indeed the painstaking work carried out on Arran to build community support for marine protection. And I pay tribute again to coast for the work they have done. Because without buy-in from the local community, marine protection areas will not work. And I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will accept that there have been significant mistakes in the handling of this policy to develop highly protected marine areas. Um, I will very briefly. Cabinet Secretary. I want to thank her for taking the intervention and for her contribution. I'm just looking at the, the foreword that I put to the consultation. Closing lines, that's why I want to hear what you think. I want to take on board your concerns. I want you to help shape the creation of these highly protected areas. How does that not demonstrate that I care how coastal communities feel? Katie Clark. The approach the Scottish Government has taken has caused upset in many communities who rely on the seas, causing concern to many who probably would never be affected by any proposals. So I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will accept that it would be far preferable for the Scottish Government to have come forward with specific proposals to restrict particular practices in defined areas and with a full and genuine consultation and evaluation process. I don't think I'll get the time back, so I apologise, I won't take an intervention. The approach, however, the Scottish Government has taken has created maximum distress and anger. The Cabinet Secretary rightly pointed out that we are in the middle of a climate and nature emergency. And the backdrop is, of course, a significant decline in the marine environment and in many parts of the fishing industry and fishing stocks over many decades. Indeed, the World Wildlife Fund report published in 2015 highlighted that worldwide the amount of fish in the oceans has halved since 1970. And indeed, the report also highlighted that the populations of marine mammals and birds have fallen by 49 per cent between 1970 and 2021. So I don't think anybody in this chamber refuses to accept the scale of the challenge of the damage to our oceans and the urgent need for action to help regenerate marine ecosystems. Indeed, many parts of Scotland, such as Ayrshire, where I come from, had significant fishing industries in the past, with coastal communities relying on the industry for jobs and livelihoods. However, what we've seen over many years, for example, with the removal of the coastal limit on bottom trawling in 1984, is significant damage to Scotland's seabed habitats um, by policies from government. And the use of high impact and unsustainable fishing practices, um, no doubt, have taken significant toll on our seas. Yet these issues, and indeed the use of high impact fishing methods such as bottom trawling and, and dredging, remain unaddressed by the Scottish Government. And indeed, more than 17,000 tonnes of fish is estimated to have been discarded by Scottish fishing boats in 2021. Um, as a result of the, the policies and the future ca catching policy is unlikely um, to address these issues. The Scottish Government have failed to come forward with a sustainable fishing policy. We I need marine protected to areas, this but point, to get Ms. that Clark. we need community buy-in. Thank you. And I call Jamie Halker-Johnston to be followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to speak in today's debate, one which will be watched with interest and with real concern in coastal communities across my Highlands and Islands region. Can I thank all the individuals and organisations who have provided input into today's debate, including many constituents who have been in contact? And let me be very clear, they are almost without exception strongly opposed to the Scottish Government's plans, and they represent communities from right across my region. And I think it's important to listen to my constituents. One of them, Kate from Dingwall, recently said of the government's plans that no other EU country has implemented HPMAs and there is no evidence to demonstrate they actually achieve their aims. 
She argued that they would have a disproportionate socio-economic impact on our island and coastal communities and that she couldn't understand why anyone in government thought it would be a good idea to take such a blanket approach. Well, I hope Kate from Dingwall will stand by those comments she made when campaigning for the SNP leadership and that she will stand up for our constituents and our coastal communities today by voting against the Scottish Government's shameful attempt to water down the Scottish Conservative motion. Only by doing so will she send out that clear message that she opposes these SNP Green proposals. And I hope those of her SNP colleagues who represent coastal communities will do the same. They will know, as well as I do, the real anger in their government's plans have caused and the real fear for the future it is causing in these often fragile communities. And they will know that if they prioritise the deal with the Greens over the future of their communities, they will never be forgiven. Presiding officer, these plans have been rejected right across the Highlands and Islands. Highland Council warned that they will stop vital economic activity in fragile remote and rural communities. And they refer reference concerns raised with them that makes comparisons between these proposals and the Highland clearances. Orkney Islands Council have said they believe the proposals could have an adverse economic and social impact on Orkney's communities and they, they would strongly oppose the introduction of HPMAs, including by judicial means if necessary. I apologise to the Cabinet Secretary, I just don't have time. And Orkney's supply chain would be impacted too. Julius Garrett of Garrett Brothers said the proposed HPMAs would be devastating not just to the aquaculture and fisheries sector in Orkney but also to the hundreds of jobs in the supply chain which depend on these businesses. In Shetland, the Shetland Fishermen's Association called the government's plans one of the most pressing threats facing all sectors of Shetland's fishing fleet and therefore Shetland's entire seafood economy. Daniel Lawson of the SFA said, Shetland's fishermen have proven in the past that they are not opposed to sensible conservation measures, recognising that strong fish stocks and healthy marine ecosystems are in their own interests and in the wider interest of sustaining our fishing community. However, proposals for HPMAs are being driven by politics and pledges and are devoid of any environmental imperative or scientific backing. Ruth Henderson of Seafood Shetland said the aquaculture sector was already highly regulated and warned the Scottish Government of disregarding the importance of the sector to jobs and in providing nutritious food in pursuit of vacuous conservation headlines. Tavi Scott, once of this place and now of Salmon Scotland, said the HPMA proposal risking jobs and investment going abroad. How does that fit with the Cabinet Secretary's own claim that our seas must remain a source of economic prosperity for the nation, especially in our remote, coastal and island communities? Presiding officers, this Green SNP coalition is pushing proposals which would decimate our fishing industry, its supply chain and our coastal communities. And so I urge all MSPs, but particularly those MS, SNP MSPs from the Highlands and Islands, put your constituents first today, not your government and their deal with the Greens. And at decision time, reject the Scottish Government's amendment and back ours. All those who care about our coastal communities and their future must come together and send a clear message to the Scottish Government they have got this very wrong and they must scrap their plans for HPMAs. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Presiding officer, the fact that we have debated the same issue twice in this parliament in the space of 36 hours says something significant. As indicated in the members' debate last uh, night, I have never had to confront anything quite like the issue of highly protected marine areas before, a policy to which, to the best of my recollection, literally every single person of the many uh, in my island community who have offered me a view is strongly opposed. As I mentioned last night, even when I was showing a local primary school around the parliament recently, the first thing the kids wanted to ask me about was HPMAs. That is a measure of where things have now reached in the Western Isles at any rate. Presiding officer, there is an undoubted need to address biodiversity loss in our seas, so I certainly do not make any case today for unrestricted fishing. And I am aware that the Tories who had HPMAs in their own election manifesto are playing political games with their own motion today. Yet the problem with HPMAs is that while only affecting 10% of our sea area, we will not know for two years yet which 10% that is. And in the meantime, every coastal community in Scotland, particularly those on the West Coast, not unreasonably has fears that it is going to be them. The prospect of a virtually total ban on all fishing activity in any one of our most fragile communities 
would, in fact, disproportionately affect some of the very forms of fishing which have the smallest environmental impacts. In areas fished by smaller vessels, like many of those in my own constituency, there is little realistic prospect of established fishing businesses or indeed aquaculture or fish processing businesses finding somewhere else to go to nearby. I know that the scenario I describe there is not what the government seeks. The very encouraging tone struck by the First Minister and other ministers in recent weeks indicating that HPMAs will not be imposed on unwilling communities is very helpful and much welcomed locally. The government amendment today, I would also acknowledge, goes some way towards recognising the fears that exist, although I regret almost certainly not yet far enough for my constituents. I realise why the government has to wait for the scrutiny of the consultation responses before it can commit to action, but I can see locally what the government must themselves increasingly now suspect, and that is the sheer depth of opposition that exists in many island communities to the proposals as they presently stand. After much thought, therefore, I am going to register those concerns in a very reluctant vote against the government's own amendment. In case anyone imagines I do such things lightly, I am someone who believes quite unapologetically that politics is a team sport. I am not one of those types who suffers from delusions that the lone brilliance of the tennis player is very often required or helpful on the political football pitch. But I feel I do have little choice today but to apply some real pressure on behalf of my genuinely worried island constituents. HPMAs, as the policy presently stands, needs to be rethought, and sooner rather than later. I welcome the encouraging way in which the Minister has engaged with those concerns today. Thank you. I call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Presiding officer, all of us depend on a healthy natural world because nature underpins life. It's not a nice to have, it's essential. But species are being lost today even faster than in any of the previous five mass extinctions. And scientists say ecosystems will collapse if we do not stop this biodiversity loss. We must act. It is in this sense of urgency which led us to ensuring protections for our oceans were included in the Butte House Agreement because what happens in our seas is just as important as our attempts on land to replant, rewild and reverse the destructive impact humans have had on our planet. And the Scottish Government does not stand alone in proposing HPMAs. Let me share with you some quotes from other supporters. Highly protected marine areas are a vital step forward in enabling our ecosystems to thrive, increasing climate resilience, and ensuring we have a healthy and productive, productive marine environment for generations to come. That's the Tory Environment Secretary Therese Coffey just earlier this year. But that's England, you may say. Scotland's marine environment is clearly different. Well, here's the Tory manifesto on which Ms. Hamilton and her colleagues stood in 2021. Our coastal communities can thrive and grow while we better protect our marine biology. The two are not mutually, mutually exclusive. Their manifesto commits to a pilot of highly protected marine areas. And here's Conservative... I don't have the time, I'm sorry. And here's Conservative MSP Peter Chapman in 2020 speaking in this very parliament. There's no doubt that no-take zones would be beneficial in the long run. And I genuinely think that having more no-take zones would be good, not only for the environment, but for our fishermen. HPMAs are a policy. I don't believe I will get the time back. I apologize to the member. HPMAs are a policy on which all parties were once united across this chamber. But the Tories cannot stand to see Greens in government actually standing up for our values and delivering our commitments to voters. So have pulled a U-turn. They've sacrificed highly Thank protected you, members. marine areas for their highly protected Tory vote. The hypocrisy of this motion, which not only calls for the scrapping of their own manifesto commitment, but claims there is no scientific basis or ecological justification for marine protections, which they themselves are rolling out in England, is breathtaking. No-take zones and strict marine protections are not only 
are not new policies the Scottish Government has thought up, but standard good practice for ocean protection and recovery with well-established zones across the world in the USA, Australia, New Zealand and the Mediterranean. The EU are currently passing a nature restoration law, which would require at least 10% of European waters to be strictly protected. To claim that this continent-wide move somehow has no scientific backing takes Brexit-fuelled exceptionalism to an astonishing level. Members, we will not continue we, shouting across the chamber. But we have just begun the process of community consultation. We must let that continue and let the genuine concern of local communities be heard, not seek to undermine the real and credible scientific basis which underpins this policy. We need a process for communities to meaningfully input into wider spatial plans for their inshore waters. The Scottish Government is consulting with communities trying to make this work for everyone with a stake in our sea. It's the Tory politicians who are playing politics, jumping on an opposition. Thank you, Ms Burgess. I must ask you to conclude at this point. Ms Burgess, thank you. You will conclude your remarks. Ms Burgess, thank you. I now call Fulton McGregor, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, and I want to highlight the outset, as uh, colleagues will know, that I do not represent a coastal constituency. And I know my colleagues who do are much closer to this issue and much more knowledgeable. Indeed, I caught many of the speeches from last night's members' debate and found these very educational. However, I know that we can all agree that we need our fishing industry to be sustainable for the future, so that is why we must make steps right now to facilitate this transition. The fishing sector in Scotland has often been the leading industry in our country's immensely successful food and drink trade. However, this very industry is at risk due to the climate crisis we find ourselves in. Where marine species are in the midst of a population decline. A report published last month by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have bluntly stated that smallholder farms, pastoralists and fishing communities could be some of the most vulnerable groups when it comes to climate change. As we have heard, HPMAs seek to protect marine environments, increase sustainability and, as seen in California, Malaysia and New Zealand, perhaps provide economic benefits to regions close to HPMAs through increased stock and ecotourism. On the other side of that, I am aware that the proposals have been met with significant criticism and objection, as was expressed by colleagues like Dr Alistair Aaron, Karen, Karen Adam, Fergus Ewing and Kate Forbes yesterday and today. And I am very much a believer in represent, representational politics, and I think it is essential that we hear concerns of communities when making policy decisions. Because, of course, if depopulation and loss of livelihoods and culture is a possibility, as has been suggested, then we must do all we can to prevent this, not least as further migration to the urban central belt will also not help us meet climate, char climate targets either. So from an outside perspective, if you want to call it that, it seems we have two strong cases, one for HPMAs and one urging a total rethink of the policy. And it is, of course, governments across the world's job to navigate and balance competing rights and ideas. And from what I can tell, this is exactly where we are despite Tory attempts through this motion to say otherwise. Indeed, the Scottish Government's initial consultation in HPMAs only closed just over two weeks ago, and it is now necessary, as others have said, to take some time to review what I believe are a substantial number of responses that were collected over a four-month period. The First Minister has made it abundantly clear that the Scottish Government will not steamroll through or impose any, on a community a policy that is vehemently opposed to which is why the Scottish Government is engaged with a wide range of fishing groups and many other environmental organisations. And I know there have been public engagement sessions and, and the like. And from what I have heard in, from yesterday's debate and today eh, from colleagues, the Cabinet Secretary has been very open to meeting with communities to hear concerns and have, has been given much credit. So the policy will get much attention. And it is important that the Scottish Government push forward with environmental policy objectives while also not leaving anyone behind and protecting our communities. So I, I would encourage the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary to continue its robust engagement with stakeholders, and I uh, eagerly await the assessment uh, of the consultation process as well. Uh, and I'd also, uh, I know other members have mentioned it, but I'd also like to hear a wee bit more about the thinking behind swimming and, and water sports uh, and stuff as well, because we've maybe not touched on that uh, as much as today. Mr. McGregor, take a give way. Yep, absolutely. Emma Harper. Thank you. Thank you. 
Fulton McGregor for giving way. It is clear that everybody, including across the chamber, um, is concerned about the Scottish Government's proposal for HPMAs are causing anxiety and stress and even much anger for all involved in the fishing sector. So would you agree with me that we need to seek concrete assurances from the Cabinet Secretaries that the fishing communities will not be decimated in this process that is being pursued by the Scottish Government? Mr McGregor, you will have to con conclude. Yeah, I, I thank the, the member for that intervention, and uh, I would agree with her, and I should have mentioned her uh, earlier as well, and uh, when it was mentioned other speakers, I know she's um, a great um, representative and advocate in this area, and as you've said, President Norris, I'll conclude there. Thank you. We now move to winding up speeches, and I call on Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, during the course of this debate, <coughs> reports have appeared in the media that the First Minister has confirmed uh, that he is happy to reconsider uh, publishing the details of um, an investigation into alleged bullying uh, made against uh, the former Minister Fergus Ewing. Now, previously it was uh, asserted by the government that this would not be in the public interest and there would be a legal bar to it. I cannot help um, but have some suspicion that this announcement by the First Minister is related to the concerns that were being expressed by Fergus Ewing last night during the debate on HPMAs. And if that is the case, I think it would be absolutely despicable. I think we heard... Look, I, I know this issue raises high emotions. I see that in my own constituency. We've had evidence of it expressed during the debate last night and again uh, today. I think there were some excellent contributions throughout the course of this debate, but I would single out um, the contribution from Alistair Allen. I know that the speech he gave in the debate last night can't have been easy. I think the, the speech um, he gave very passionately in this afternoon's debate would have been even harder. Um, as somebody who has rebelled against my party, I think some would argue that this is perhaps more commonplace in my party than in his. It is not an easy thing uh, to do. This is uh, a team sport and I, I don't doubt for a second that Dr Allen has come to that uh, decision very, very reluctantly. But I think the views that he expressed uh, on behalf of his constituents uh, are ones that are reflected in coastal and island communities uh, around the, the country. And I hope um, that his constituents um, will consider the speech that he has given, the decision that he has taken um, as being uh, an exemplification of the way in which we as elected members ought to be representing our constituents and constituencies. The problems with the approach to HPMAs are, are many and various. Um, I, I think the fact that there is a lack of in, uh, evidence, a lack of clear purpose um, to the proposals um, has not helped. But the blunt and arbitrary nature of a 10% designation by a timeline of 2026 uh, I think it, it puts the tin hat on it for many people. I, I know the Cabinet Secretary reflected earlier that there is a need for an emergency re response in, in relation to the climate and biodiversity uh, emergency. But in an emergency response, you are still, despite having to make difficult decisions, you're still going to have to bring people with you. And my concern is that the approach the government has taken has so alienated key stakeholders in this debate that the ability to reach agreement on the protections that may be needed uh, going forward is going to be immeasurably more difficult as a result. Rhoda Grant um, uh, mentioned the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the approach that the reference in the government motion to Lamlash Bay. Um, I, I was very interested in the, in the uh, insights that Katie Clark was able to bring uh, in terms of the bottom-up approach that was taken there the buy-in that's absolutely needed. And I think that is what um, we would all wish to see, whether it's with MPAs, whether it's um, with uh, stricter um, uh, protections that are put in place. If they're imposed from above, they have no prospect uh, of, uh, of being accepted and therefore delivering the objectives uh, we wish uh, to see them uh, deliver. This is about the fishing industry, certainly, but it's around... Um, depopulation, it's about the viability of, of many communities. And again, like I did last night, I would simply urge the, the uh, government to think again, to fundamentally think again on these proposals and the damage that they are likely to cause on island and coastal communities. Thank you.
Thank you. And I call on Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. This uh, has been a vital debate uh, for our Parliament, but particularly for uh, the communities that we serve. It will, as many members have said, be watched closely by constituents from around our coastal communities. Um, but I think it's also a taste of, uh, and a test indeed, of the very idea of a just transition uh, in the face of what we all recognise as a climate and nature emergency. Uh, and that matters to all our constituents across the country, the approach that we take to this idea of just transition. And I do think that Parliament has been clear today across all parties that the government must do better, that it must listen and it must bring these people with them. Um, and so rightly, I believe, when we talk about these ideas of transition, the, the, the SNP government continually reject the idea of the Tory approach to economic change. And they, they, where they have abandoned our coal field and our industrial communities over generations. But it must not, and it cannot be, Cabinet Secretary, Lerwick no more, Kirkwall no more, Stornoway no more, Ullapool no more, Arbroath no more. But tragically, I think today's debate is just the latest example in a litany of policies from this government which have failed our coastal, but particularly our island communities. Ferries that don't materialise, a breakdown in crofting regulation, delays in extending reliable broadband provision, housing policies, pushing families out of villages, and a tokenistic commitment to the Gaelic language, which I will come back to. This government's myopic focus on central belt policies has served our island and coastal communities poorly for 16 years. The protection of Gaelic and our ancient cultural heritage cannot be achieved without the protection of the communities that speak Gaelic. The language is a question of economy. The systemic failure of our, uh, of our island communities in the west of Scotland by this government is leading to depopulation and the destruction of livelihoods. So that was made clear in a research paper titled The Gaelic Crisis in the Vernacular Community, published in 2020, and it had this stark warning. The Gaelic speaker group does not have the demographic or societal resources to sustain a communal presence in the islands beyond the next 10 years. 10 years. While we undoubtedly face that climate crisis, the government must recognise, President Officer, the concurrent demographic crisis in the communities most impacted by the proposals that we are debating today. That paper went on to highlight the ongoing economic and demographic challenges in the Western Isles and other island groups exacerbate matters. The retention, uh, no, just let me finish this and I'll bring the minister in. The retention of young people and young families willing to contribute to community vitality will be central to any credible strategy of revitalisation. Please. I, I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. Um, he, he rightly sets out a, a swathe of concerns, but can I ask him, does he accept that where those views are held, by consulting as broadly and as early as I have, and by committing to very closely considering the responses before deciding steps forward, I have engaged coastal communities as early and as meaningfully as I can? So, I, I would say Michael to the Cabinet Mark. Secretary, not quite gently, I have to say, that meaningful consultation is genuinely about listening and changing. And that is the opportunity that is in front of the Cabinet Secretary today, to accept the motion and the amendments that are in front of her, to listen to some of our backbenchers, but crucially to listen to the people in these communities who do not see, many of them, a future for themselves and for their children and their grandchildren in the places that they love and that we are elected to serve. The government cannot persist in willful ignorance of the realities of life in those communities. Islanders are making sure of that. And I have to say, Parliament today has made sure of that. The people have raised their voices through the consultation the Cabinet Secretary talks about, and those voices are being heard in this debate through many of the speeches. Those voices cannot be ignored. Please, please, please think again. Thank you. And I call on Mary Goujon, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I really do want to thank members for their contributions today, and I'm glad to ha have the opportunity to take part and close this debate in my role as Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands, given my responsibilities for fisheries, for aquaculture and cross-government work on islands. 
These are responsibilities that I care about and that I take seriously. And I do really appreciate the gravity of the concerns that have been raised across the Chamber today. And I have really listened intently to each of the contributions that, that members have made. Like the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero, I represent a rural constituency and coastal communities within it. And like Mary McAllen, I care about what those communities are saying to us and what they're thinking. Just as I know that all of those who have taken part in the debates today, yesterday, as well as took part in the meeting with Mary McAllen and myself, uh, do too. All of that is very clear from the contributions that we have heard in the Chamber this afternoon. Firstly, I want to welcome the widespread and the shared recognition that I think we all have of the importance of the Scottish fishing industry, the aquaculture industry, as well as the importance of having healthy and vibrant coastal communities. Scotland's marine environment is a national asset that we are privileged to have. The resources it provides maintain, they create jobs, it brings prosperity to coastal and island locations and to the wider supply chain across Scotland. But we need to, uh, yes, I will. Liam Kerr. I, I, I'm very grateful. Just on that last point, I wonder what assessment has the Scottish Government made on the economic impact to those very fishing communities and coastal communities of a fishing ban? Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure the member will be aware that we've published partial information in relation to that. But of course, in relation to the socio-economic impacts, the island community impacts assessments, we can only fully complete those when we have sites in mind so we know what the exact impact of that is going to be and we can look at that more fully. And that's why the partial assessments were included within the papers. Now, oh, sorry, not at the moment. I need to make progress. We need to recognise that our marine environment and the resources are also under pressure like never before and that bold and ambitious decision making is needed to ensure that we do have that sustainable future. Alongside other priorities the Government are delivering, HPMAs will have a role in helping to preserve our natural capital our marine industries depend on and safeguarding our marine environment for future generations to enjoy. And that's essentially what this is about. This government's priority is the long-term sustainability uh, of our communities, for our economic growth, supporting people to live and work in our rural areas and really helping those communities thrive. But we're also wholly committed to protecting the marine resources our fishing industry depends on, with consultation embedded at every stage and with just transition at the heart of everything we do, to give us the best chance of arriving at the right decisions for the right reasons. Now, this is the complete opposite approach to what we are seeing to be delivered elsewhere. We don't have to look far to find those examples. HPMAs are in the process of being introduced by the UK government, who are implementing pilot sites in England. They're doing that, and we're seeing that being done in a top-down way, with unclear goals and in inappropriate locations. And I think it's also important to remember that two of those sites have already been dropped because of rejection by those communities. Unlike the Tories, this government isn't willing to base the future of marine protection in Scotland on pilots in English waters and based on the English fishing industry when they are profoundly different from those in Scotland. And to do that would mean that Scotland's unique interests are being disregarded. But it's also not clear from the debate today whether the Scottish Conservatives support their own manifesto commitments on HPMAs or not. Indeed, all the opposition parties campaigned and were elected on manifestos that committed to pursuing a policy in this regard to enhance protection of our marine environment. I know that Katie Clark in her contribution mentioned that we should have introduced specific proposals, but I think that would have been the complete opposite approach to what we're actually trying to do, which is consulting at as early a stage as possible on how we even go about this process, which I think is really important. I know that we all agree about the importance of fishing and aquaculture to our economy. That's why we've supported the industry with significant amounts of funding over previous years, 9.7 million in fishery science. We've negotiated 468 million pounds worth uh, through our international fishery negotiations because we recognize the importance of the sector. And I'm sure that we can also all agree on the fact that we need to take action on the climate and nature emergencies. And I'm sure we would also all agree that we need to do that in a way, as the Cabinet Secretary described in her opening, which is fair, which is just, which leaves no one and no community behind. The Scottish Government wants to work hand in glove with all of those who have a stake in this, the communities, the fishers, our marine industries, to create the best possible future for our environment, our economy and for those communities. 
In closing, Presiding Officer, I, I really just want to reiterate again some important points. Firstly, that we will not steamroll through or impose on any community a policy that they're vehemently opposed to. We, again, to emphasise, I'm in my closing remarks, I, again, to emphasise, we are at the very start of this process, not the end. Thirdly, we've had a consultation. We will carefully look at all of the responses we've received. We will be engaging with industries, with communities, and we are listening. Let's agree to put people ahead of politics and help make the consultative and collaborative process to deliver that vision of a positive future for our environment, economy and communities as successful as it can be. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Finlay Carson to wind up the debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister stated, my starting point will always be that we all want the best for Scotland and the people that we are so privileged to represent. Powerful words, and I genuinely hope that he delivers on that promise, particularly in light of the response to the ill-conceived proposals in introducing highly protected marine areas, which have sparked enormous backlash amongst fishing communities a length and breadth of Scotland. They rightly fear that if the plans to increase limitations on inshore fishing and marine activities goes ahead, they will devastate many coastal communities in what has been described as the modern-day highland clearances. Jamie Halker Johnson mentioned Kate from Dingwall, and her comments remarkably similar to MSP Kate Forbes, who voiced deep concern during her leadership campaign, saying, I cannot understand why anyone in government, particularly when we are tr deliberately trying to stem depopulation in rural areas, thought it would be a good idea to take such a blanket approach. She more recently suggested that the government may have turned a corner. Sadly, from what I can see from the government's amendment, the only corner they've turned is the corner that leads to a dead end for our fishing communities. Would the Change Finley Carson take an intervention? I certainly will. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, would Finley Carson be able to enlighten me as to the government motion what an HMPA means? Yeah, certainly, it, it came to light that uh, the government's uh, amendment certainly doesn't mean to uh, uh, make sense, and it might be helpful if the cabinet secretary explains which HMPA is. We didn't get that right. um, but one thing obvious is that change in direction isn't unusual for the SNP because they've had more changes of direction than the wind off the Muller Galloway. One thing certain is the SNP Green Alliance won't be satisfied until even Gudlin and rock pools is prohibited. Karen Adams, Emma Harper and, before her pay rise, Jenny Minto have spoken out about the enormous levels of concern that exist in the, fu in the future of our fishing communities, with primary school children even questioning Alistair Allen over HPMAs. The phrase, leave a light on, was once a commonly used phrase for this SNP Green Government, but this time it's them who are looking to turn the lights off in our coastal communities. Yeah. Perhaps the most emphatic critic has been Fergus Ewing, stating the only mention of fishermen says that what they do is destructive, describing the consultation document as a notice of execution. If these HAPMAs go ahead, everyone involved in our seafood industry sector will have the spectre of redundancy hanging over them for many years to come. Is the Scottish Government going to seriously jeopardise plans for a workable blue economy just to appease the Greens, who make no mistake are the extremists behind this highly contentious back of a fag packet policy commitment? They can't even turn up in the chamber in any numbers to defend their policy. Yeah. There is no robust policy analysis, no data underpinning the process, no time to establish baselines, no indicators to measure the effect and, critically, no assessment of the impact of thousands of families in the rural communities. But should we be surprised, given the central belt bias that we often see from this green SNP co coalition? It's only the Scottish Conservatives who understand and stand up for our rural and coastal communities. Yeah. Seafood, presiding officer, is a key part of Scotland's transition to net zero, and we need policies that support sustainable low-emission food production, and that goes in hand in hand with marine conservation. The seafood sector is highly, supportive, is highly supportive and for generations has practised meaningful and well-founded conservation, but the HPMA policy fails to appreciate that. These proposals for, uh, sorry, I, I don't have time. These proposals for HPMAs threaten balance, with the government unable to provide any substance to why they believe they are needed. As Elspeth Madonna of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation points out, the latest response from the government is both misleading and hugely concerning. It takes as fact that HPMAs will happen, making a complete mockery of the consultation process. 
The Scottish Government is clearly only interested in discussing where HPMAs will be imposed, not whether the case for them has been made. Karen Adams has already sought to be given assurances from both the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary that HPMAs would not be imposed on communities. Now, that language has now changed to communities that are vehemently opposed. Does that mean protests outside Parliament or gunboats quelling troublesome fishing boats? If vehemently could be defined or measured, it's evident that the government has moved the goalposts. Perhaps Mary McCallan can tell us what she plans to do if the consultation reinforces the universal opposition to HPMAs from coastal communities across the width and breadth of Scotland. What happens to the Butte House Agreement commitment to the Greens to bring 10 per cent protected areas in? Further, furthermore, the Scottish Government makes a misleading statement claiming the plans are in line with those of Europe. Wrong. Wrong. They're going to exceed them. Wrong. The EU target is 30 per cent of waters. Uh, it's similar to our existing MPAs, which allow some fishing and aim to strike the right balance between conservation and sustainable harvesting. Scotland has already almost 40 per cent of its waters under some con uh, uh, protection. So here we're adding another 10 per cent of total fishing ban. Now, I'm quite sure that even SNP Treasurer can do that simple sum. The Cabinet Secretary said she cares, she empathised, she's a rural MSP and deeply connected and listening but not so deeply connected or willing to listen to stakeholders in the Hunting with Dogs bill, where she effectively banned the legal activity of rough shooting after watching a YouTube video. And she doesn't understand that Muirburn doesn't burn peat. So how can we place any trust in her or our colleagues' judgment to get this right? This is all the signs of being another example of bad policy making. Acronyms seem to be the common thread of green SNP policy, from DRS to GRR. R100 to QNCR, and now it's HPMAs. It should be TTFN. Ta-ta for now for this policy. It should be tagged do DNR. Do not resuscitate this dead duck policy. Our manifesto supports a pilot, but we did not support a blanket introduction of HPMAs. Yep. PA, presiding officer, in closing, we have already heard about the anti-HPMA protest song, the clearances again by Skippernish, highlighting the real fear surrounding the serious economic and social devastation this policy will uh, bring. My song marks a fight for survival, a mayday cry we cry. We will stand for the rights of our children, we will not let our islands die. Alistair Allen, Karen Adams, Enna Harper, Jenny Minto, Marie Todd and Enna Roddick, don't allow yourselves to be bullied by the whips. Stand strong for your communities. Where will you place your allegiance at decision time? With extreme policies of the Green or with the communities you represent? Please conclude, Mr Carson. You will be letting your communities down. They will be watching.